It's President's Week here on The Rubin Report, working with Learn Liberty to bring you five shows in five days on five different presidents of the United States. And joining me today is Professor of History and Economics at San Jose State University and author of the book, Emancipating the Slaves, Enslaving Free Men, A History of the American Civil War, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Welcome to The Rubin Report. It's a pleasure to be on The Rubin Report. We have already, just in the few minutes we've been sitting here, we talked about almost every other president. <laughs> right. Now I guess we're gonna have to get to this Lincoln guy. Yes, definitely. Let's do it. So first off, the obvious question, was he actually a vampire hunter? <laughs> Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> it's not a show that I watched. No, no, <laughs> or, okay. or was it a movie? I forget. It, it was a movie. I, I thought it was a documentary, but uh, apparently yeah. not. All right, there's a lot I want to talk to you. Now, it was obvious when we were selecting our five mm -hmm. presidents to do this week, we wanted to do some of, the, some of the big ones and some smaller ones, and hopefully we'll do this for many years to come and can get to everybody. But Lincoln was the one I was like, all right, we got to do it because I think if you poll most Americans, they always say that Lincoln is their favorite. Right. I think probably George Washington comes in second, but I think Lincoln is the big one. Um, so I wanna do a little bit on his bio, then I wanna do obviously on the political stuff and, and civil war and freeing the slaves, and I wanna talk about some of the interesting criticisms that you have uh, of him in this book. Uh, but first, let's just start a little bit about childhood. Where should we start? Uh, well, Lincoln was born in Kentucky, uh, 1809. Um, and grew up in a, in a uh, very poor frontier household. Uh, his uh, mother died when he was very young, uh, was partly raised by, a, by his stepmother. They moved to Indiana. And basically, um, he educated himself. Uh, and, um, and it was a humble background. Yeah, as he, would have, as, he, as he described it himself. How was that possible to educate himself back then? I mean, was he just grabbing books? Or he was just he grabbing them? books and reading them at every opportunity he could get. Um, uh, and um, uh, yeah, that's, basic, that's basically the story. <laughs> yeah, do we know anything about his further education as he got a little bit older? Uh, I don't know anything about his further education. I don't think he was university educated. Um, he obviously went on to get a law degree, but in those days getting a law degree was you clerked under a lawyer and then um, you hung out your shingle. Right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, as far as formal education is concerned, uh, he didn't have very much of that. Yeah, was his real ambition at first to be a lawyer? Uh, I don't know whether he had a real ambition at first. I mean, you know, he, 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 he had a lot of other kinds of more frontier-oriented jobs, right? That's how he got the nickname, the rail splitter, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> working on the rivers uh, and, uh, and those sorts of things. And so um, I think he just sort of fell into uh, law. Yeah. So. He's a lawyer. But, but, but eventually, I mean, eventually, politics became his passion. Yeah, so he's a lawyer, and then <clears throat> politics became his passion. Yeah, is, I would say there... those two are interrelated, because remember, at that time, uh, um, many of your politicians, if not most of your politicians, uh, were, either came through the military or, or through the uh, profession of law. Yeah, was there a seminal moment for him that he realized this is <clears throat> when and why I have to get into politics? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, life happens <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and opportunities open and you take advantage of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he had a, a, a legal profession, uh, in Illinois and then he was elected to the Illinois legislature, uh, eventually elected to the house of representatives, uh, for, <clears throat> a short time uh, and, um, and became very prominent uh, in the Illinois Whig Party. Yeah, what were his politics like in time? And what was the Whig Party like? Okay, I think well, this is one of the places if, people if, don't really know. If, if you um, look at the two parties ideologically, at that time it was the Whigs versus the Democrats. Uh, the Whigs um, were the inter interventionist party. Uh, the Whigs were in favor of high protective tariffs. 
Um, they were in favor of uh, spending a lot of money, government money, on internal pr improvements, what we call infrastructure today. Uh, and they were in favor of a nationally chartered uh, bank. And <clears throat> a lot of these policies were the outgrowth of one of the most prominent Whig leaders, Henry Clay, mm -hmm. and what he termed his American system. Whereas by uh, this time, the Democratic Party had become the party of uh, laissez-faire, uh, low tariffs, uh, getting rid of the national bank, and in fact, actually trying to divorce government from any relationship uh, with banks, um, <clears throat> and at least uh, trying to keep the federal government out of funding internal improvements. Yeah, that, that's very interesting to me because in a modern sense, that seems to be a bit of a reversal on right. where, where we're at right now. Right. Was, was Lincoln really in line with the oh, yeah. he policies was, I mean, he this? really admired Henry Clay. Henry Clay w w was his hero. Um, and he, uh, he supported all of those policies down the line. When he was in <clears throat> uh, the state legislature in Illinois, he was crucial in passing a very expensive internal uh, improvements program in Illinois that subsequently almost drove the state into bankruptcy, hmm. uh, financing of canals and, and railroads. Yeah. Uh, so fiscally, at the time, he was, he was spending a lot, and did the, did the infrastructure deal actually make sense? Uh, well, um, uh, uh, no. <laughs> in, other words, <laughs> in other words, if, if what happened is that the states went through sort of two phases in terms of infrastructure. The first phase was canal building, and the second phase was uh, railroads. These are often referred to as phases of the transportation revolution during that period. Uh, the canal building orgy was actually set off by um, New York building the Erie Canal, which is one of the few examples of a socialist enterprise that actually made a profit. Mm. And so this inspired a lot of other states to build canals, almost all of which um, lost money and created financial problems for the states that uh, 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 built them, um, which is, suggests that they uh, were not economically justified. Yeah. Uh, and then as a result of the states losing so much money on the canals, um, initially they um, were heavily involved in railroads and they continued to subsidize the railroads, but at least uh, by the uh, 1840s and 1850s, they weren't um, owning outright the railroads the way they had owned outright the canals. And therefore, um, uh, even, uh, the, 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 there was a little bit too much railroad expansion uh, subsidized by the government, but it wasn't as significant as the problems created by the canal building. Interesting, because this, this is a part of Lincoln that I don't, you know, we mostly think about the Civil War right. and freeing the slaves. But the economic part is sort of interesting. What do you think his sort of overriding economic policy was? Because it sounds like it was a, it was a lot well, of spending. Well, he, he carried this policy into the presidency. Um, the first uh, subsidized transcontinental railroads were during Lincoln's administration during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, and that resulted in many other transcontinentals and uh, being subsidized by the national government and a whole bunch of uh, pork barrel legislation in the, in the post-Civil War period and a lot of scandals, um, uh, corruption involved as well. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, so his economic views continued throughout his entire uh, career. And these were, this was the main dividing line between the two policies, mm -hmm. to the, between the two political parties, uh, because up until the Civil War, uh, both political parties tied to straddle the issue of slavery, so they would both be national parties. Mm -hmm. um, so they tried to keep it out as best they could out of the political uh, arena. Yeah, when did he start talking about slavery, really? I mean, when he was in the Illinois legislature. No, he doesn't really start talking about slavery. Um, he, uh, he, he had a visceral dislike of slavery uh, from his youth. But he didn't really start talking about slavery until um, um, after the Kansas-Nebraska Act and slavery becomes a uh, prominent issue and it causes uh, the death of the Whig Party. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and the collapse of the uh, uh, of the Whig Party. Yeah, can you explain that a little bit more? Why why that actually? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The well, see, both parties initially try to straddle the slavery issue, but as as it evolves over time. Um, the Whig Party, being more interventionist, tends to be stronger in New England, um, uh, whereas the Democratic Party, tending to be non-interventionist, tends to be stronger in the South and the West. And so uh, the, both parties feel the strain between Northern and Southern Democrats, Northern and Southern Whigs, but the mm -hmm. Whig Party is actually blown apart uh, by that strain after uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And the one issue that uh, causes the demise of the Whig Party uh, is slavery. So you have the split between Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs. Mm -hmm. um, and then also another issue that comes to the fore during that period is immigration. Um, uh, there is a uh, nativist movement uh, that uh, um, uh, some uh, Whigs uh, end up embracing, and that also is a, plays a role in the in the demise of the Whig Party. Yeah, what was his policy on immigration? Um, well, actually, Lincoln was fairly good on that. I mean, he, he, in other words, there was a debate within the councils of the Republican Party about, um, you know, between those who were more nativist and who, those who were less nativist, and Lincoln was definitely on the side of the one he didn't want. He didn't want the Republican Party to be to take a, a platform stand on on nativism opposing uh, 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 immigration. Or actually, they 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 weren't proposing restrictions on, on immigration so much as restrictions on acquiring citizenship. So when the Whig Party fell apart and then basically the remnants became the Republican Party, what what, what was that like? What like were, did they literally just? Well, vote actually, out the people or am I, well, am I well initially, initially, the Republican Party is a coalition of anti-slavery Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats. Mm -hmm. So it um, it's exclusively a sectional party. It's uh, or almost exclusively. So just Primarily, to, be to be really clear on that, though, so the Republican Party actually was the original anti-slavery party. It was taking from right. both sides and was right, uh, right, taking. Now we need to be clear about this term anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Uh, because being anti-slavery was a was a, a broad tent. Um, at one extreme were the abolitionists, um, and at least in, in America, the term abolitionist re refers to uh, uh, anti-slavery uh, advocates who favor immediate emancipation of all slaves mm -hmm. um, and full political rights uh, for uh, all African Americans. So. Um, there's a whole uh, range of anti-slavery uh, positions. Yeah. And so the Republican Party, uh, the abolitionists are always a, a minority, and the Republican Party um, succeeds where the abolitionists don't succeed by uh, reducing anti-slavery to its lowest common denominator, essentially one issue, mm -hmm. which is opposing the spread of slavery into the territories. And so you have uh, and again, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, um, in which, uh, in which uh, Kansas and Nebraska were um, opened uh, to slavery uh, in violation of the Missouri uh, Compromise, is what sort of inspires this uh, concern among anti-slavery Northerners. So just to, just to be clear, at the beginning of the Civil War, there are a lot of Democrats involved in, former Democrats involved in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Lincoln's Secretary of State, Salmon Chase, is a former Democrat. Um, several Republican governors uh, and, and senators, uh, pardon me, uh, yeah, Republican senators and governors are former uh, Republicans. So mm -hmm. in Lincoln's election, um, the Republican Party has to sort of straddle these economic issues mm -hmm. to keep both <laughs> um, sides of the coalition together. Where did he fall when, when he was running for president? Where did he fall on that scale of abolitionist to what, what would you call he the was, other, what would was, you call that other group? They were sort uh, well, of well, they're just uh, they're just anti-slavery. Yeah. And um, but what, what that approach that they had? What would you refer well, to? Like, was that pragmatic, or what did they base it in? Uh, well, gradualist, pragmatic, 
basically, again, this is where Lincoln follows Henry Clay. Um, Henry Clay was, a favor, was in favor of um, colonization. Uh, in other words, uh, not just uh, having a, a plan of perhaps compensated emancipation um, in which freed slaves um, are uh, uh, moved to a back to Africa. Mm -hmm. And Lincoln um, was a big advocate of colonization. And in fact, he continues to pursue colonization um, even after the outbreak uh, of the Civil War. Um, by the end of the Civil War, he's probably given up on that, but during the Civil War, uh, he um, uh, sponsored one uh, uh, disastrous attempt at colonization in Haiti uh, that, um, that just didn't work out. Yeah, what, what happened? I don't even well, know. Well, what happened is that they, they got, the, um, I'm a little bit hazy on the details, but, but um, some land was acquired in Haiti and they got some African Americans who agreed to move there and then it was not just economically unviable, but uh, uh, had problems with disease and so the whole colony uh, collapsed. In other words, he wanted to do, uh, he, w he wanted to push in, in um, Latin America something similar to Liberia mm -hmm. um, in, um, uh, in Africa, which also was also a colonization scheme uh, set up by the American Colonization Society, of uh, which Henry Clay was a participant. Right, so it, there's a couple of interesting things there. So you referenced that the Whig Party itself had a sort of internal conflict between their northern representatives, that would be someone like Abraham Lincoln, right. and their southern. If you were a local representative in the legislature in Illinois, did it ever come up to talk about? I mean, why would slavery have even really, it was only within the national discussion, right? Like, was it something that people were actually voting on in any way in Illinois? Uh, not at the state level, no. Yeah. Um, th there are- It's hard to think of party politics in a 2018 lens without everything being right, right. Uh, it, national and everybody affected by every little thing, yeah. Yeah, no, it, the only sense in which it was, it, the only sense in which the state, you, you got involved at the state level was with respect to the fugitive slave law. So if you look at the history of slavery, there's always this tension between free states and slave states, um, even at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, but it um, is usually kept below the surface, um, except during uh, these uh, uh, instances where it, where it erupts and then it's resolved. So you first have uh, Missouri coming in as a slave state, which leads to the Missouri Compromise and then uh, things calm down. And then you have the tariff issue, which is partially driven by South Carolina's slave. Um, and then you have uh, things calming down. With the annexation of Texas and California coming in as a state, slavery becomes a big issue again. Um, and it's partially um, uh, um, um, uh, calm down by the Compromise of 1850, and then after that you have the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and then, uh, then there's no calming it down anymore. Yeah. And the Compromise of 1850 is responsible, part of, the, part of what Southerners got out of the Compromise of 1850, or more precisely slaveholders, was the, slave, was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Um, now one of, the, one of the constitutional deals I mean, right in the Constitution, there's a fugitive slave provision in which um, it's the obligation of free states to return runaway slaves. And the Washington administration actually passed the first Fugitive Slave Act. But the mm -hmm. Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was one of the most draconian laws that Congress ever enacted. Yeah. And um, uh, in other words, it set up a, a bureaucracy of commissioners who would hear um, uh, cases of fugitive slaves. They got five dollars if they decided that uh, that the uh, person wasn't a slave, and ten dollars if they decided he was a slave. Right. So that tells um, you right there. Uh, they. Um, the slave had no right to uh, representation, um, a jury trial, no right to testify, the alleged slave, and uh, the, uh, the commissioners could um, uh, 
um, uh, require the cooperation of individuals um, uh, to apprehend runaways. And if you violated uh, that, you could face um, a jail sentence, $1,000 fine, wow. uh, $1,000 civil penalties for each escaped slave. So it was pretty, so many of your northern states began, had before this, but began after this, passing what were called personal liberty laws, mm -hmm. um, trying to make sure that state officials did not participate in the apprehension and return of runaways. It and so like that's, the, that's, that's, the, that's the big slavery issue in northern states. Yeah, it sounds like such a crazy thing because they were incentivizing the northern right, states yeah. that may not have wanted to send the slaves back. They were literally financially incentivizing. And then as you're saying, there were other people, they were just citizens that were going out there. Right, and it also, it also also made it easier to engage in kidnapping um, free blacks. Yeah. Uh, bringing them south. Who was fighting this the most? I mean, I would imagine there must have been some states' rights people in the north that maybe didn't even care about slavery per se, but must have said, you can't tell us yeah, well, what well, to this, do. Yeah, this well, is, this is one of the things after the Compromise of 1850 that brings slavery, um, starts pushing it to the forefront. And of course, this is when uh, Elliot, uh, Elliot <laughs> uh, Uncle Tom's ca cabin, um, Henry B., what's her first name? I'm drawing a blank. Uh, well, it'll pop in a second, don't worry, you'll get it, you'll get it. Um, uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe writes Uncle Tom's Cabin, which mm -hmm. becomes a bestseller, and it's about the fugitive slave issues. Mm -hmm. So it sensitizes a lot of Northerners to the fugitive slave uh, question. And so uh, Illinois doesn't pass a, a personal liberty law because Southern Illinois is um, actually settled by, um, uh, from the southern, uh, s the eastern uh, southern states, uh, but some of your uh, other states like Pennsylvania uh, and states uh, further north do pass personal liberty laws yeah. uh, as a result of either before the Fugitive Slave Act or after the Fugitive Slave Act. So before we get directly into the presidency and the war, is there anything else we need to know about Lincoln's politics at the time or what else was influencing him? Besides, obviously, there were states' rights issues. There was obviously the, the slavery issue. Uh, was there anything else that we think of as really the moments that kind of shaped him before the presidency? I think, I, think we've, I think we've covered the important issues. Those, those are the big ones? Okay, so he runs for president. What, what do we need to know about that platform? Well, as I say, it tries to paper over the difference between former Democrats and former Whigs. It has a, a, it has a, a plank about... Um, uh, about the tariff uh, that uh, can be interpreted <laughs> differently. Uh, but the primary uh, plank is, uh, is opposition to the spread of slavery into any more territories. Um, and uh, what's interesting about that plank is that um, it's essentially that plank has essentially been declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision. Hmm. In the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court says that um, uh, uh, the, uh, the territories are the common property of both nor Northerners and Southerners, and therefore the national government cannot restrict the property rights of Southerners when they move into the territories by pre preventing them from bringing their slaves. Uh, so the, so you, have a, you have a platform plank. <laughs> That was, that was literally unconstitutional. Uh, declared unconstitutional. I mean, most Supreme Court, uh, mo most uh, legal scholars today think it was a very bad decision, but yes, it was, had been declared unconstitutional. What, what do we need to know about the, the tenor of the political infighting at that time? You know, these days everyone always says, never, everything's never been worse, everyone's meaner than ever before, and you know, Trump's tweeting this and all that, but uh, there were some pretty serious fighting and, and, and yeah pretty. yeah th th those kinds of claims are are exaggerated I mean um, you you can find uh, um, campaign rhetoric and campaign literature that uh, if not vicious verges, verges on being vicious throughout this the period leading up to the 
Civil War. I wouldn't say that the Civil War uh, or the 1860 election um, is particularly unique in that respect. Um, but what happens is that you end up having uh, four candidates. Uh, Lincoln is the candidate of the Republican Party. Um, and then the Democratic Party splits. So you have Stephen Douglas as the candidate of the Northern Democrats. Um, John Breckinridge is the candidate of the Southern uh, Democrats. And then some of your um, uh, upper tiers, former Southern Whigs um, form a constitutional union party. So to oversimplify only a little, it becomes really two elections. Mm -hmm. um, an election between Lincoln and Douglas in the North and an election between Breckinridge and John Bell and the Constitutional Union Party in the South. Yeah, so the next obvious segue is the Lincoln-Douglas debate. Right, that's, now that's before the 1860 election. It, it was for that election though. No, no. No? Oh. No, this is, remember this is a time when um, senators are still chosen by the state legislature. Uh, so that's one of the things that makes the debate unique because it's, it's the 1858 Senate election in Illinois. The legislature is going to choose who um, is going to be the senator, but the Republican candidate is, is Lincoln. The Democratic um, candidate is Douglas. Oh, I didn't know and that. And then they go around um, and have these debates um, at various locations um, uh, throughout Illinois. That's funny. I mean, I like to think that I know a lot about this stuff. I had no idea that that wasn't uh, on the national scale because they did run against each other just two years later. Two years later, right. So wh what was and that? And this, yeah. this, this actually propels Lincoln into the forefront of potential candidates for the Republican nomination in 1860, even though the legislature chooses Douglas um, as uh, Illinois senator. So when the, uh, for, I want you to explain what the Lincoln-Douglas debates are and why there's such a richness mm -hmm. there, but was nothing like this even done before that? When we, everyone talks about it like it was so revolutionary or we so yeah, desperately could use it these days. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as say nothing like it, but in terms of how extensive it was and um, the draw, uh, it was unprecedented. Yeah. Uh, Can you explain the basic tenets of sort of how it would work? Um, well, basically, they, they picked out various locations in Illinois. I forget the number of debates. And they would travel there, and then they would um, uh, face off each other. And the big issue was slavery. And Lincoln, um, his position was prohibiting slavery, the extension of slavery into the territories. Um, Douglas's position, he was trying, he was, the Democratic Party hadn't split. So um, he was um, trying to maintain the unity of the Democratic Party. So um, uh, his position is known as popular sovereignty. And his view was that um, uh, we leave the territories open and then let people in the territories decide whether um, it's going to be uh, a slave territory or a free territory. But that creates a certain amount of ambiguity because mm -hmm. when do they get to decide? <laughs> right, I mean, did they right, only get to decide um, uh, uh, at the time of statehood? Um, also, uh, uh, if they decide before statehood, aren't they violating the Dred Scott decision? <laughs> So, so that was, but there was also a racial element to the debates mm -hmm. um, because you, br you brought up the issue of viciousness in the campaigns. Um, the attempt is to um, paint Lincoln as an advocate of um, racial amalgamation mm -hmm. um, because uh, even in the North, uh, despite the, the Northern states being free states, um, in most of the northern states, African Americans face legal disabilities mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, and significant social discrimination. So, so, so at this time, uh, Lincoln would make the distinction between, um, between a civil equality, political equality, and social equality. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, civil equality is mean, means being equal before the law. Mm -hmm. Political equality would involve giving African Americans the right to vote, mm -hmm. and then we know what social equality is about. So his position, um, at this time, he did not advocate political equality, was not in favor of giving African Americans the right to vote, but he was firmly in favor of civil equality, and that's where he and Douglas differed. W was that part totally pragmatic? in that he felt if he said, well, I am for having African Americans. It might have been pragmatic, but remember, he, he's a, as I said, he was, a, he was in favor of colonization. Mm -hmm. uh, even if he, even when he began to entertain views of political equality, um, for pragmatic reasons, not politically, but for pr pragmatic reasons, he wasn't sure the country was ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in other words, he would use arguments which I think are sincere that that um, that the you know uh, uh, that the two races are not going to be comfortable living together, and that it would be better off for African Americans uh, once free to uh, move elsewhere. Yeah. Now he eventually he eventually drops that, and eventually by the end of his life was uh, favoring uh, a limited franchise for uh, uh, freed African Americans in Louisiana. So, at that so point, he's, his ideas are changing, they're progressing. Yeah, yeah. that's what's interesting, is that there is an evolution yes. here, which really we find out really in the presidency. Did the abolitionists basically hate him at that point? I mean, did they think he was sort of a sellout or that he just, because he was doing the pragmatic thing. Yeah, to, some abolitionists did. Yeah, yeah some abolitionists did. Uh, uh, and um, uh, um, so there was still, there had been, before the creation of the Republican Party, there had been the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party, which were slightly broader anti-slavery coalitions, but minor, minor parties. And there still was a radical abolitionist party that ran in 1860, but it garnered very, very uh, few votes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we started touching on the beginnings of the election. So basically four candidates running right. because of the split in the, the Democratic Party. What else do we have to know before he gets elected, that, that happened. That's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, he didn't win the popular vote, uh, but even if you combine the vote of all the other candidates, he still would have won the Electoral College. Right, interesting. So what was the beginning of his presidency like? Uh, well, um, the beginning of his presidency uh, is um, uh, dominated by the uh, uh, secession of the Deep South. So- How soon after he was inaugurated? Uh, well. After he's elected, um, the Deep South secedes, yeah. with South Carolina being the first state, and then you have the cotton states um, seceding. Was he even inaugurated at that no, point? No, no, he was not. It, that was right after the election. I mean, that's incredible. By or, the way, yeah. one interesting detail that um, a lot of people are unaware of, in South Carolina's Ordinance of Secession, um, and they're the first state, they're the, they're the most firebrand of all the... Uh, secessionist. Um, <clears throat> uh, in their ordinance of secession, um, they do not, uh, the, the issue they give the largest play to in terms of justifying secession mm -hmm. um, is not Lincoln's election, but Northern failure to comply with the fugitive slave clause of the Constitution. Huh. Now, partially that's a rhetorical ploy because right. it allows them to argue that the Northerners had, um, ha had violated the constitutional contract first, mm -hmm. but it also reflects a deep concern about um, uh, fugitive slaves. And, and one of the, one of the um, uh, points that I make in my book is that I think most historians have underestimated the economic significance of the of the fugitive slave issue in terms of uh, bringing on se secession, and maybe we can get to yeah, that. Yeah, no, later. no, I, I I do want to get to that. So, um, so, so you have the Deep South seceding, mm -hmm. and they're seizing all of the U.S. military bases, mm -hmm. except for a few that are holding out, and yeah. the prominent one that's holding out is Fort Sumter in uh, Charleston Harbor. Uh, so James Buchanan has to deal with this. He's the lame duck president. He tries to reinforce uh, Sumter and uh, South Carolina fires on the ship and so, but the garrison is still there when Lincoln it becomes president. So that's the big issue that's dominating uh, Lincoln's presidency is yeah. what, do you, what do you do about Fort Sumter? 
and um, uh, uh, Lincoln, um, you know, the, he's getting all kinds of advice. Uh, some people want him to try to um, back down on the Republican position about slavery in the territories, mm -hmm. but he absolutely refuses to do so. I mean, he's, he has agreed to enforce the Fugitive Slave Act as president. So it's, this is the only anti-slavery issue, <laughs> right. and, and he decides to hang on to it. Um, and uh, some want a more aggressive policy, some want a more passive policy. Basically, um, Lincoln essentially follows um, Buchanan's policy, although Buchanan gets a lot of <laughs> criticism. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask you that. Um, and what happens is... Well, Buchanan's uh, policy being what? Being uh, trying to reinforce the fort, but not using military force to, um, to, to uh, um, hold on to the fort. Gotcha. All right? So uh, Lincoln sends... Um, reinforcements and supplies to the fort, uh, uh, telling the, uh, South Carolina that he's doing so. By this time, the Confederacy is formed. The Confederacy fires on Fort Sumter, right? And, and that's the 9-11 that's the of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. It polarizes both sides. Um, it polarizes um, Northerners, because there are, up until this time, there are a lot of Northerners who say, well, we should let the South go in peace. Many of them think, well, if we let them go in peace, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time of Lincoln's inauguration, there's still more slave states in the Union than out of the Union. Um, but Lincoln responds to the firing on Fort Sumter by calling out troops. Mm -hmm. And immediately, Virginia, North Carolina, um, Tennessee, and Arkansas all joined the Confederacy. So it, 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 yeah. it, it's the great divide. Um, what, what so with a, with a stroke of the pen, he's, he's doubled the size and the material resources of the Confederacy. Yeah, what do we know about his thought process at the time? Well, was he really ready for the fallout that was gonna happen? Um, yes and no. And then the escalation, obviously, uh, that led to the war. Yes and no. Let me back up a little and yep. explain why he had to do this, all right? Uh, why it was politically necessary to do this. Um, many of your abolitionists, um, particularly William Lloyd Garrison, who's one of my heroes, mm -hmm. um, who was advocated immediate emancipation, full political rights for all African Americans. He was also a pacifist. Um, an anarchist, a classical liberal in favor of free trade, free labor. I gotta, would, do, I he gotta do more on this guy. <laughs> he, his opposition to slavery, a lot of the radical abolitionists f uh, framed it um, as man-stealing, um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, property rights. And he was also in favor of northern secession uh, from the Union, because hmm. he saw the Constitution as a pro-slavery document. Hmm. Uh, he um, denounced the uh, Constitution, um, uh, publicly burned a copy, and uh, on the masthead of his, uh, of his uh, paper, the Liberator, no union with slaveholders, um, graced it throughout uh, from 1831 on up to the Civil War. And, and this was true of many of your most radical abolitionists. Mm -hmm. So um, basically what your abolitionists and one of the reasons they were so unpopular is because they were saying you can't have anti-slavery in union. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, people are committed to the union, right? So they're not happy about the abolition. Yeah. The Republican Party, by reducing um, the anti-slavery issue to its lowest common denominator in the territories, is telling the public you can have uh, anti-slavery in union. Mm -hmm. All right, well, once the union's threatened, the Republican Party is going to have to suppress secession mm -hmm. or face political oblivion. And in fact, even if Stephen Douglas had been elected president, he's an old hardline Jacksonian. If he had been elected president and the South had still seceded. Now that's not very likely. But if he had been elected president and the South had seceded, he probably would have moved uh, military force against the South even faster than Lincoln. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so interesting because I think one of the themes as we do this whole week is looking at uh, 
these people through a 2018 lens. And when you hear that somebody didn't want full rights for people but wanted to free them or they couldn't vote or some of the other issues you're talking about, and yet at the same time you're saying, but the abolitionists actually weren't that popular. Right. It's like to, give, to view these people through our lens today is, is really, it's a very slippery slope because Lincoln had to do some things that perhaps uh, in our lens now would have been viewed as very unfair to the African Americans. Right, yeah. And there he was. So okay, so the, the war begins and he's a, he's a new president at war. Uh, who is he getting advice from? Where, like, did he really understand how to Okay, to well do the, this? The, the other part of the answer to your question is that um, uh, Lincoln and many of the Republicans and many Northerners in general underestimated um, the enthusiasm for secession on the part of Southerners. They believed, initially believed, that it was a Southern elite of slaveholders, almost a conspiracy that had brought about secession. And, that, um, and that's why they weren't prepared um, for the extent of the resistance of uh, Southerners uh, once Lincoln uh, calls out troops. Yeah. A and so once he calls out troops, then, then you have the problem of managing the war. <laughs> so there was really nothing he could have done at that point, even if, even if there were voices, even if he internally felt, well, maybe we could just let them go, or if he had voices around him that were saying, ah, you know, it's all right, Poli let them secede. It was too late, really, right? Yeah, politically, yeah. all right, politically. I mean, by that time, um, in the North at least, not, not in the Deep South, but in the North, liberty and union had become mystically identified uh, as inseparable. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so that's, um, and in fact, right, it, this leads to the question of uh, the, a more basic question of what caused the Civil War, mm -hmm. right? And there's now a current trend to argue that slavery caused the Civil War, and not only did it cause the Civil War, but it was all about slavery, uh, and that in fact slavery, um, the entire history of the U Union up until that point is all about slavery. Yeah. You disagree with this <laughs> and premise? I, dis I, know I, dis that, I so, yeah, I dis take it away. Um, I think that asking what caused the Civil War is the wrong question. And um, even some of your neo-abolitionist historians like Ken Stamp and Eric Foner have pointed out that there are really two separate questions. Why does the South secede? And why does the North refuse to let the South go? And the answer to the first question is definitely slavery. Mm -hmm. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming for that. There's probably hardly any um, historical causal explanation at that level of abstraction for which um, the evidence is more overwhelming. So right. the South secedes in order to protect slavery. Okay, so that's but, the easy one. But um, ending slavery is not what motivates the North. Yeah. What motivates the North is preserving the Union. And in fact, Lincoln, um, uh, in the, uh, before the firing on Fort Sumter, endorses a original 13th Amendment, which is not passed, in which he's still holding to the position of opposing the extension of slavery in the territories, but this new amendment would protect slavery in the existing slave states and be unamendable. Mm -hmm. um, in the early um, days of the war, uh, some of your Union commanders were returning runaway slaves. So, um, so, the, so, so the war, from the Union perspective, the suppression of secession is designed to preserve the Union. And Lincoln even later says if he could preserve the Union by freeing all the slaves, he'll do that. If he could preserve the Union by freeing some, uh, none of the slaves, he'll do that. If he can preserve the Union by freeing some and, <laughs> and leaving others enslaved, he would do that. What was his real belief in the Union based in? Did he, did, did he just truly believe that we had to remain one country, otherwise we would be yeah. in perpetual war? Is that yeah, really yeah, what it came Yeah, yeah, yeah. He thought that the, the, the disso dissolution of the Union would lead to anarchy. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because... Now, now, one of the things that's 
uh, one of the things that's interesting about historians is the the even historians who don't seem to be explicitly nationalist, the, mm -hmm. their nationalist bias with which they um, approach that issue. Uh, so, uh, for instance, um, the U.S. Uh, has made several attempts to annex Canada um, in the early history. Uh, first during the American Revolution, then during the War of 1812, and then uh, between and after those events uh, by sponsoring the kinds of uh, revolutionary movements that uh, brought Texas into the Union. All right? If any of those had succeeded, <laughs> Historians would be Trump writing would history. Be president of Canada. Yeah. <laughs> Historians would be writing the history of North America as if this was an inevitable, and any other result would have been catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, my view is uh, that the North, uh, that the North American continent has gotten along fine with two Anglo-American republics. If it had been three or more, history would have been different, but mm -hmm. would have been uh, would wouldn't have been catastrophically different. And, and the, speaking of the example of Canada, you know, when Canada was looking at the, at the secession of, the peaceful secession of Quebec, mm -hmm. its population was about the same size as the Union <laughs> at the Is time. Is that of the right? And the population of Quebec was greater than the Gulf Coast Confederacy that initially seceded and slightly less than the Confederacy once uh, Lincoln had called out troops. Did Lincoln have any advisors or anyone close to him at the time that was just saying, forget this? The, you know, just let them go? We're, no. we're going to do it, live by our laws here? So he really... Uh, yeah, well, it, there, were some, um, there were some newspaper editors prior to Fort Sumter who were um, in favor of a peaceful secession mm -hmm. and uh, uh, letting the South, South at least temporarily go in peace. Uh, there was even a secessionist movement uh, in New York City. <laughs> hmm. uh, but um, Meaning they wanted New York City to secede? Yeah, yeah. Even though geographically <laughs> that didn't really make any sense? Okay. Right, and, uh, um, and uh, he, uh, Lincoln's um, um, uh, Secretary of State um, toyed with the idea of provoking a war with Great Britain in order to bring... Huh. <laughs> really? To get everybody... Yeah, 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 everybody uh, sewered wow. um, back together. But, um, but nobody really, at least within Republican councils, accepted, um, uh, once, especially after Fort Sumter, uh, the preservation of the Union uh, becomes uppermost. Yeah. So most of his presidency, which obviously was cut short, and we'll get to that mm -hmm. shortly, um, was uh, it was about the Civil War. I mean, right. Is, is there what else do we have to know? How sort of towards the end of the war, what other decisions did he make that were sort of pivotal? Um, well, he starts a reconstruction program, uh, which um, is relatively lenient um, compared to the congressional reconstruction. Uh, that is eventually uh, implemented after uh, Lincoln's assassination. Lenient in what regard? Um, lenient in terms of um, allowing white Southerners um, uh, a free hand in terms of, of uh, as long as they abol had abolished slavery, of re-entering uh, the Union. And how was that different than what happened? Well, then? basically, um, uh, well, this is a complicated story. I'm going to try and make it really simple. Okay, right. you have this first phase presidential reconstruction, which Lincoln initiates and then becomes really lenient under his um, uh, uh, su uh, successor, Andrew Johnson, um, who was from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very racist um, but anti-slavery Southerner. Um, and what happens is that the southern states essentially set up um, under uh, um, uh, a lot of the former Confederate leadership um, an apartheid regime with black codes that are very re um, restrictive uh, on, the, on the activities of, of the freed African Americans. And this outrages um, um, northern Republicans. 
And so you have a period of congressional reconstruction where none of these governments are, they're, they're all disbanded, you have military occupation, and then you have the creation of new Republican governments in which a lot of Southerners are disfranchised and African Americans um, are given voting rights, and so you have a period of Republican regimes um, in the South. And then that creates the resistance of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan mm. and other violent organizations. And uh, by 1876, Northerners have gotten tired of trying to maintain these regimes with military occupation. And so you have what's euphemistically referred to as redemption, where you have the restoration of, uh, of white rule um, throughout the uh, former slave states. Yeah, so it, I, it's just hard to imagine what a messy time it would have yeah, been yeah. during those years, just healing all those wounds, literally family members having killed each other. And, right, yeah, and, especially in your border states like Kentucky and Missouri. Yeah, I mean, it's really just hard to imagine what it was like. So. The North obviously wins, the South right. does not secede, the Union is maintained. Uh, what was happening just in the weeks leading up to his assassination? Well, Lee surrendered. Um, uh, same month, I believe. And so it was clear that um, it's, it's, it's clear that the, that the Confederacy has lost the war. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you have the passage of the 13th Amendment uh, by Congress, it still has to be ratified by the states, um, uh, abolishing uh, slavery. Uh, and uh, those are the, most, the two most important uh, events leading up to the, yeah. to the end of the war. So to talk about the assassination for a little bit, I mean, obviously, just from everything we're talking about, and it was wartime and everything else, obviously, you know, tensions were high and all that. Was there any reason to believe that anything like this was going to happen? I know that may sound like a, it's a very open question, but, you know, like, were, were there attempt, att assassination attempts before that? Anything well, there that were, people Well, there felt? was always concern about Lincoln being assassinated, yeah. particularly at the outset of the war. Uh, I mean, pardon me, at the outset of his administration, so when he initially comes into Washington, um, he comes in disguised uh, because of concern about uh, an assassination, of rumored assassination attempts. Hmm. And then during the inauguration, um, uh, you have uh, um, sharpshooters <laughs> um, stationed at the tops of buildings and, um, and other, provisions made by General Winfield Scott to make sure that there is no assassination attempt. Because remember, Washington, D.C. is south of Maryland. Mm -hmm. Maryland is a slave state. Mm -hmm. um, it's a slave state that doesn't secede, only um, partially because of Union military force interfering with elections and throwing secessionists um, in jail. Well, wow, that's interesting. Um, and Baltimore, um, is, at least at the outset of the war, is a pro-Southern um, hotbed. Uh, so there were always concerns. Yeah. Uh, but we don't have the Secret Service. In fact, the Secret Service is created during the Civil War, <laughs> wow. mainly to track down counterfeiters. Huh. It's one of the many government agencies that we've come to all love. Right. So <laughs> that it emerges it, during the Civil War. Wow, that's wild. So it started to track down counterfeiters, <laughs> yes, and now yeah. it's clearly gone beyond that scope these days, but that, yeah, that, it, that's a whole other topic. So I, I assume that the day, I mean, if we had to look at Lincoln the morning he woke up before he went to the theater, he had to have been feeling pretty good about things. I mean, he had to, com well, he, he he was, had to accomplish the, the thing that was most important to him, basically. Right. He, uh, certainly he was feeling relieved. Yeah. Uh, what should we talk about related to the assassination? Um, well, give me the basics for, for people that really well, don't Well, know I, I don't, uh, I mean, um, there's now evidence that um, there was more involvement of uh, uh, con uh, Confederate um, counterintelligence, whatever you want to call it, than we previously, in other words, it wasn't entirely um, John Wilkes Booth and, and his Confederates. Uh, 
Uh, is there hard evidence on that? Yeah. I've yeah. heard little things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, um, uh, but I don't really have a lot to say about, about the um, assassination of Lincoln. Um, insofar as, okay, here, one of the big debates is if Lincoln hadn't been assassinated, would he have continued um, his lenient policy towards uh, the southern states? And, um, and I go along with the historians who say no, that um, he was trying um, leniency in order to try to reestablish the Whig party mm -hmm. um, in the South, but it wasn't turning out that way. And uh, congressional reconstruction may not have been quite as harsh under Lincoln um, as it turned out to be without Lincoln. Uh, but, um, but Lincoln's views had evolved to the extent that he would not have been, uh, would have been willing to tolerate the black codes that, um, uh, that the uh, states were setting up. So you think certainly by his second term where he would have had a freer hand, he would have done a lot of the things that... Well, that happened during Congressional Reconstruction. Yeah, that's my speculation. Yeah. What was it like after the assassination? Well, it's like any assassination, you know, there, um, there, there is um, uh, a manhunt. Um, there is an attempt to track down the conspiracy. Uh, and uh, you have several conspirators hung, including Mary Surratt, who, and there's a lot of controversy about whether she was actually involved or not involved. And, uh, uh, so it certainly hardens northern attitudes, um, but remember... Um, was there really a feeling that he was the one keeping it all together at that point still, or, or what was the feeling that the war had been won, it was, it was going to be okay either way? You know, he was such a symbol of what had happened. Um, he, I mean, he, he had all... Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, in some circles, um, he had already become deified, but not to the extent that the assassination deified him. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, uh, he, remember, he'd already been elected for his second term, so, so he did not face uh, significant political opposition. He, there was, there, before the, um, fall of Atlanta, there were, there, there, because the war had dragged on so long, um, it wasn't always clear that Lincoln would be renominated by the Republican Party, and there were elements in the Republican Party um, uh, who wanted to replace him, and rivals who wanted uh, to replace him. So, um, uh, really, um, uh, you, you have you have Andrew Johnson being president, you know, for most of Lincoln's second term, and uh, he's impeached, <laughs> or almost yeah. <laughs> he's impeached and almost removed um, uh, from office uh, because of his disagreement with uh, the Republicans, who are in tight control of Congress because. Um, the southern states have been kept out, mm -hmm. uh, are still not in, um, except for uh, Tennessee, um, and the slave states that didn't secede, they're, they're still not um, uh, in the Union, are, are permitted to have representatives in Congress. So the Republicans have a free hand, irrespective of whether Lincoln's in, in office, or Andrew Johnson's in office, or Grant is in office. Right, interesting. So one of the reasons that I wanted to do this YouTube week was to help frame things around how politics are right now. So to sort of wrap all this up first, um, wh what do you think Lincoln's politics would be today? If you were to try to take the things that you think he believed in the most within a sort of modern context, is there a way that you can make sense of that? Because I see he gets used by everyone all the time. Lincoln would have been a Republican for this. He would have been a Democrat for this. Is there a way yeah, you I can don't, frame I that? Yeah, don't like, I don't like playing that game. Yeah. I mean, things have changed so much. Um, uh, um, 
it's really, it, it, and the context is so different, um, it's really hard to say. Uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things about Lincoln, and this is one of my, uh, one of my sort of reservations or criticisms of Lincoln, actually criticisms of the people who deify <laughs> Lincoln mm -hmm. um, as president, is the Whig Party had this ambivalent attitude in terms of government versus the presidency. Um, they were in favor of a lot of government intervention, um, but at the same time, they had emerged in opposition to Andrew Jackson and his very um, vigorous, often high-handed presidency. So they tended to favor um, the legislature as the dominant uh, um, uh, mover uh, uh, force in the government rather than the presidency. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Lincoln had imbibed this Whig attitude uh, about uh, administration. And as a result, I think um, being a wartime president, he had to ignore it to a large extent. But I think that um, it created some of the um, administrative problems uh, that emerged during uh, Lincoln's uh, presidency. So I think Lincoln would, be, would have very um, ambivalent feelings about how powerful the president has become uh -huh. uh, within government, irrespective of what policies were being implemented. I will accept. I will accept that as an answer. That that really was what I was trying to get to. Not that he would have endorsed this policy or that policy, but just his general take on what power was, the office of the presidency, and and things of that nature. Uh, well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I think. Are we done? We're done. We did the whole hour. We, we that was a that was a pretty quick hour. Did we, did we miss anything major? Hey, we missed a lot of major things. All right, give me something major that we missed. Um, well, I uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you a couple things. One is, I mean, my book. You didn't mention my book. Let's talk about your book. <laughs> well, I think you sort of hit on it there. Right. You're more critical My of more his critical. involvement in the war than, than right. some yeah. of the people who deify Yeah, the, the book is a narrative history of the Civil War. Um, but I have about half a dozen provocative theses where I disagree with prevailing views. And one of them is um, that I argue that if um, Northerners had been interested in ending slavery rather than preserving the Union, mm -hmm. there is a set of policies they could have adopted um, allowing uh, the Lower South to go in peace, uh, which would have um, brought down slavery um, within um, an independent confederacy, certainly by the turn of the century and possibly within four years. And why letting them go would do that? Um, well, letting them go didn't necessarily do it. It just means that you didn't have to kill 750,000 people in order to bring about the end of slavery. Right. In other words, I think there, were, there, was a po there's a, there are a set of policies that it could have achieved the same goal at less cost. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and in other words, I think you can, like the, I was actually, on, turned on to this alternative by Garrison and the other radical abolitionists. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can be uh, rapidly anti-slavery and still pro-secession. Mm -hmm. um, the second uh, important argument I make is, has to do with uh, the growth of government. Um, um, uh, I think it's uh, a commonplace observation that government today is a lot more powerful and a lot more intrusive mm -hmm. than it was um, earlier in our history. And whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, there's the question of what changed and mm -hmm. what brought about the change. So um, the popular story is that it's the New Deal, right? That made the big change in, right. in, um, in the growth of government. And I think that's mistaken. Um, it's mistaken uh, in part because uh, the New Deal was essentially a recreation of Woodrow Wilson's war collectivism and the impact of the New Deal on government um, was dwarfed by the impact of World War II. Um, now, now there's some elements of truth. The New Deal gives you social security um, and along with Medicare that's become government's biggest expenditures. More sophisticated um, commentators uh, would push the change back to the progressive era, uh, 
in the early 20th century, but I'm arguing that the Civil War is the crucial watershed hmm. in American history, that prior to that, prior to the Civil War, the long-term secular trend had at all levels of government for government to become smaller, less intrusive, less involved in people's lives, and that the turning point is the Civil War. Hmm. That leaves him with a complex legacy from some yes. small government people. Yes, yes. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because during the Civil War, I mean, national conscription, um, uh, the U.S. moves from free trade to high protective tariffs, uh, the first Western country to do so, um, uh, massive subsidies to railroads, uh, uh, first subsidies to higher education through land grants, um, and I've already gone over my time. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got one more, one more big, big point that's in the book related to Lincoln. Uh, yeah, one more point that's related to Lincoln. Um, uh, I think that one of the reasons it takes the Union so long to defeat the Confederacy is because of Lincoln's bad administration of the military. Hmm. Uh, there, he, he tended to micromanage um, the war, uh, uh, like Lyndon Johnson tried to micromanage the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And historians want to place all of the blame on Lincoln's generals, uh, whereas I think that really the source of the problem is Lincoln. Um, consider the Eastern Theater, all right? So um, you have a succession of commanders. Irvin McDowell, defeated at the first bull run, replaced by McClellan. McClellan is almost supplanted by John Pope, who's defeated at the second bull run, only to bring back McClellan, then to replace him with Burnside, who admitted to him, admitted that he wasn't ready to command the army, and then Hooker, and then wow. Meade, right? Now normally, right, and this is within a period of two years, two, three, two and a half years, normally this doesn't war earn administrators high marks. <laughs> You'd think. <laughs> in terms of how they're um, managing things, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think that, um, I mean, there were problems with all the generals. Uh, the advantage that the generals in the West had, Sherman and Grant, is they weren't micromanaged by Lincoln, and therefore they could make their mistakes early in the war and learn from them. Yeah. Well, I like that you gave us a complex view. I mean, that's really why I wanted to do this, that you know, we pick certain ones. Right. I think Lincoln is one that we all sort of view in this lens of there, oh, this, this, this perfect being. Yeah, the cult although, of Lincoln. Of course, and of course he did a tremendous amount of good, uh, but it's interesting hearing what the, the little imperfections are and, and all sorts of things. So on that note, it has been a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> and for more on Jeffrey Rogers Hummel, check out his book, which we're gonna link to right down below.